Good evening, and welcome once again to The Bible Speaks Today from Latonia Baptist Church Television Ministries. It, it's, it's been a couple of weeks since we recorded anything, not, not for you, of course. You've been seeing this, these programs back to back as they come. But we've had a, a, a week off for meetings and things, and, and this evening's been one of those, we're going to record a program, but first we've got about 16 other things to take care of, um, producing video clips and all the things that, that, that are involved with a TV ministry and a TV studio. No, no different from, from your ABCs, NBCs and all the rest of it. There's a, it's not just the one broadcast. There's a lot of preparatory work. There's a lot of technical work goes on. And I've been sitting watching the team scurry, and, and I use the word scurry, uh, used in English, uh, usually with mice, you know, little mice running everywhere. And, that, and that's exactly what it looked like in here earlier on. Um, you might wonder um, the change in title, and we are in fact doing Nazareth this week. We finished Bethlehem last week, which was for us a couple of weeks ago, uh, and you haven't seen it yet. Well, sorry, you will have seen it by the time you see this one, but we're, we're, we tend to record several weeks ahead so that we can take a break in the summer, just like everybody else does, okay? And uh, talking of summer reminds me that uh, it's one of those times of the year when one does the jobs that one has been dramatically avoiding for some time, you know, like edging and mowing and trimming back the trees, or in my case, washing the siding down on the house. There cannot be any more cruel, demeaning, soaking wet, miserable job than that. And I don't care if you use a power sprayer or whatever you use, I think almost we'd be preferred to get up and scrub it by hand. It would be less arduous. Anyway, that's what I've been doing for the past few days. Uh, luckily, it's done now. At least I think it's done. My chief inspector um, hasn't actually gone out and looked at it yet. So I'll hear that when I get home tonight. Okay, we're doing Nazareth. Now, you might, as I said last week, you might wonder why we're doing these cities. But there is a very good reason. Because they all, all are all part of this understanding the Bible. If you understand where it happened and that maybe the what was happening at the time and who lived there, what then you'll understand the impact. And in fact, sometimes the Bible says things and you think, well, that's a bit strange. And then you read the history or you do a watch a program like this, which tends to describe what's happening, and suddenly you realize, oh yeah, I can see why they did that, you know. Um, why did they stone them? Because there wasn't any wood around to beat them up with? I mean, and that and that's not intended to be a joke. That really isn't. Um, you're probably aware that the cross that Jesus died on had been used before and was probably used again. If we consider that modern scholars believe that it was basically an upright with a, with a, a, a T-piece dropped onto the top of it. Uh, the Romans didn't have enough timber around. There wasn't enough timber around in, in the whole of Palestine to... Um, to keep making up, oh, let's make another few crosses. They just used what they had. Like like in the old days, the gallows. They just put a new piece of rope on, didn't they? And, and, and before you say, oh, yeah, there's lots of trees in Palestine. Yeah, well, it is today. But back then there wasn't. If you remember when Solomon built his temple, he imported all the cedar work and the woodwork from Lebanon, didn't he? It's, it's in a, another Bible story. Okay, anyway, so we're talking about Nazareth. And this is the last city we'll do for, for a, a short period of time. We'll go, we'll go on to something else uh, before the summer starts. The picture behind me, by the way, in case you hadn't picked it up, that is, it's, it's a model, unfortunately, not the true picture, because obviously the temple no longer stands. But that is the Jerusalem temple from about all this, where all this accumulated, if you will. Uh, I think it's a marvelous picture. It's on my, it's a screensaver on my computer, as a matter of fact. Um, and and the wall you can see in, in the foreground is the is the the Wailing Wall, which you you see in the in the um, in all the tourist pictures and this sort of thing. Very very cool. Anyway, I just thought I'd mention it. Okay, Nazareth. Well, in Arabic it's called Naziri, uh, Nazira rather. In Hebrew it's Nazareth. Um, it is in the Lower Galilee. Uh, um, part of northern Israel and surprisingly enough it's the largest Arab city in the whole country 
you know, I mean, you think maybe Jerusalem would be, or maybe the other cities up there, or, you know, Bethlehem perhaps. No, Nazareth is the largest Arab city. And what we're going to do tonight is talk initially in in generalities, and then I suppose you don't have to watch the rest of the programs because you'll know it all. But no, don't do that because it, it's more to come. But in, in the New Testament, of course, Nazareth is 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 uh, uh, Jesus' boyhood home. Uh, he preached his first, or made his first public announcement, if you will, in the synagogue in Nazareth, which um, led to his rejection, remember? Uh, we'll talk a bit more in detail about that. I mean, the city now, Nazareth now, is, is the centre, other than Jerusalem, it's the centre of Christian pilgrimage to Israel. Despite being an Arab city, access to it whilst difficult sometimes and again we'll talk about that in future programs but but uh, it, it is probably more people go to Nazareth than go to Bethlehem or, or Jerusalem surprisingly enough and yet it's odd because the meaning of the city's name is is uncertain it, we, we'll go into this I don't mean to keep putting you off but we will go into that later on in the program but I mean it's not even mentioned in the Old Testament you don't believe me? Look at your concordance. Pick it up, look for Nazareth. It's not in the Old Testament. It's not even in the rabbinic literature, you know, the, the Talmud that follows the Torah, you know, with all the, you know, this is what that really means and this sort of thing. It's not there. In fact, the first reference, the first biblical reference, let me make that clear, is, is, is in First John in the New Testament. And, and then, if you think about it, and if you remember, um, the, the contempt that that people thought about Nazareth. So it must have been a real, you know, run-down place at that time. Because, I mean, what, is, what did it say in John? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? That's what people said, you know. Oh, this guy's from Jesus. He's from Nazareth. Oh, really? You know, you, well, we don't expect much then, do we? You know, I mean, it's like, I don't know, whatever, think of a flesh pot somewhere in the world, I don't know, the slums of Cairo or something like that. And somebody says, oh yeah, he came from the slums of Cairo. <sighs> really? You know, it, it's, it, it has that connotation. I mean, from Nazareth, Jesus went on to uh, perform his first miracle. No prizes for that one. Uh, I won't even ask the camera person because they probably know her anyway. But that, you know, changing the water to wine at the wedding in Canaan, is in 2nd sec in John. Um, and uh, and in Jesus' time, of course, Nazareth had a Jewish population, not an Arab one. Obviously, Israel was then populated predominantly by, by Jews. And, and really, the first time the, it's Christian holy places, okay? The first time, you know, uh, the, the places that are important to us Christians, the first time they're mentioned is after Christianity became the state religion of the Roman Empire in 313, third century church by then. Um, actually, it's second century, isn't it? Second century church. And that was due to Constantine, of course, and his mother. And again, she features in the picture here, surely too. But anyway, and, and surprisingly enough, now I'm going to take some flack for this, I know I am, from the diehards and the people who've actually been there, and, and, and said, oh, no, that's not the case. But the only site in Nazareth that can be absolutely positively identified with the New Testament writing times is the town well, for logical reasons. That if, if, if that's the only water supply to the town until modern times, of course, then, then obviously it would probably stay open unless it ran out. It's called St Mary's Well now, but but um, but um, that's the only one that that can be actually archaeologically okay. This stone here came from first century or B, uh, first century B, BC. Okay, um, and I say okay a lot. My my producer said that to me, and I, and I apologise for that. If that's irritating with you. I'll, um, I'll try and curtail it. I mean, during the Crusades, again, everything in, in Palestine, everything in Israel gets involved in the Crusades, doesn't it? 
As I said last week, the Crusades were the most significant event, other than Jesus' birth and resurrection, uh, to take place in, in Israel or Palestine than anything else, that those Crusades changed the whole world. Um, in about 1099, I mean, as I say, we fought over Italy because obviously the Crusaders regarded it as their, their uh, holy site and, and the Arabs didn't. Um, there was a Norman Sicilian. Now, you know, we, we always see the Crusades. We always see Englishmen, don't we? Robin Hood and uh, his people and, and, you know, the old um, Red Cross and that sort of thing. And, and in fact, more Crusaders were foreign to England. In other words, uh, they were Europeans, Sicilians, Normans, uh, French, German, everything. I mean, some of the castles, if you, if you visit Israel and look at some of the Crusader castles, they're not English at all. They're, they're, they're German design or French design, okay? Anyway, Tancred, who was a Norman Sicilian crusader, so I guess he was a Sicilian who lived in Normandy. Anyway, he, they captured Galilee, the whole Galilee area, in, in 1099. And he set himself up for a while as the Prince of Galilee, okay? With, with, with Nazareth as the capital, okay? Along comes... So, uh, Salah Adin, remember him, in 1221, 1291 rather, and, and uh, the, the Crusaders get finally, totally expelled out of Palestine. Remember, they were there for a while, uh, sort of half the country was theirs uh, uh, due to a treaty, and eventually they got kicked out. The Christian influence there in, in, in Nazareth sort of died off when the Ottoman Turks took Palestine. That's the Ottoman Empire from Turkey, modern-day Turkey, in the uh, early 16th century. And they, of course, first, what do you do when you're a Muslim religion and you take a town that's full of Christians? You expel them all, right? So, so they all got expelled. Um, and in fact, it wasn't until 1590, nearly 1600, that uh, Adin II, who was the emir of Lebanon, and he reigned over that period, Christians were permitted to return to Nazareth. So nearly nearly 400 years where there were no Christians living in Nazareth. Now, we don't think about this consciously when we read and so on. You know, we always assume Nazareth is Christian. It's always been Christian. There's always been this and that and everything else there. Not a bit of it. If you were, if you were born during the, the period of time between 12 and, and 1600, right, Nazareth was, would be a, would be a uh, uh, unknown to you almost other than as a remote possibility because it wasn't in Christian hands I mean right now today as I said it's the big, biggest Arab city in in the West in, in, in Israel but Christ, Christian Arabs there is such a thing of course Christian Arabs form about a third of the population which makes sense when you think of how many Christian churches are there. So I'm just going to run through some of these churches at the moment and get it out of the way so I can concentrate more on, on, on the in-depth stuff. Uh, and of course, Nazareth, Nazareth, it's hard to get out, uh, many attractions, one of the chief attractions, are its many churches. I mean, there are, there are a great many churches. I'm not even going to be able to name all of them, even if I've got all of them down here. Um, the Roman Catholic Church of the Annunciation, which is 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 reputed to be where where Mary get the, get got the message or Joseph and Mary got the message. Um, actually, the the church today was completed in 1966, but it's based on the site of a previous church of about 1700 and something, and that itself is based on a Crusader foundation back in 1000 and something, 1100. In the church, and maybe by next week I'll have my pictures lined up and we'll get some pictures for you, but in the church is the Grotto of the Annunciation, which according to the New Testament is, is where the Archangel Gabriel appeared to the Virgin Mary and announced that she would be the mother of Jesus, recorded in Luke. Now, one thing, one thing to remember when we talk about biblical sites in Israel, in Jerusalem, in Bethlehem, in, in any of these, Shechem, all these cities we visited is. When I say it's the reputed site of the Annunciation, that's exactly what I mean. 
because nobody can be absolutely sure. And I'm not being facetious here, but Mary did not carve on the wall of wherever she was. Gabriel was here, okay? It probably, at the time, it wasn't considered very important. It just didn't happen that way. But people, over the years, over the centuries, really, start to say, oh, well, there's a grotto there. That must have been the place. And, and in any case, if we, if we respect it for that, what's the difference? And, and really... That's absolutely true. If, if you visit the Grotto of, of the Annunciation uh, and, and say this is where we commemorate the, the Annunciation uh, uh, of the birth of Jesus, that's one thing. If you say, no, this is the actual spot carved in stone, you're probably barking up the wrong tree. And I know people don't like to hear that, but I mean, as I said, Bethlehem was out of, I'm sorry, Bethlehem, Nazareth was out of the control of Christians for hundreds of years, so who knows? The Church of the Annunciation, by the way, is the largest Christian house of worship in the whole Middle East, which is as it should be. It's huge. We'll show some pictures later. The other important churches include uh, um, uh, Gabriel's Church, where the Greek Catholics, Greek Orthodox, uh, consider it to be the site of their Annunciation. Like I said, you know, there are two, two Jesus tombs in Jerusalem. Many of you who have done your studies will know that. I mean, it, to me it doesn't matter. The very fact that Jesus had a tomb from which he later rose is the most important thing. I really don't care, you know, to, if it's a tomb, it's a tomb. You know, it's a hole in the wall with a, with a niche for a body. I mean, but there are two of them in Jerusalem. And each claims to be the one. Okay? It's like, you know, um, um, somebody's got the pistol that shot Abraham Lincoln and somebody else has got the other one. <laughs> it's one of those things. The synagogue church, which is, again, based on the traditional site of the synagogue where it used to be back in Jesus' time, where Jesus preached according to Luke 4. There's the church of Joseph, on the reputed site of Joseph's carpentry shop. Uh, and, and this one gets me. There's the Table of Christ Church. Nothing to do with communion, except that its tradition holds that Jesus dined with the apostles after his resurrection. Now you'll notice the Bible gives us no clues whatsoever about where these places are. There's, there's one not tradition, it's a supposition. If you remember that uh, when Jesus was captured in the Garden of Gethsemane, one of the young disciples ran away and somebody grabbed his, his cloak and he ran away half naked, if you remember. There's a tradition bolstered by a fair amount of research that the fact that was in fact Mark and it was Mark's father who had the house in which the Last Supper was, was held. And that's why he was with the disciples. And that is why Paul didn't want him to come with him because he knew that Mark had run away. Again, interesting story. But we've no idea and no way of, of, of proving it any more than we know whether where, where the table of Jesus... And I'm not even sure if they have a table in this church. Probably do. Okay. There's the Basilica of Jesus the Adolescent. Now what do we know about Jesus? Any, come on, any of you. Somebody wave their hands at me. But Jesus, okay, okay, going back to the temple when he was 12 and losing, losing yeah, absolutely right. Um, when they were the Festival of Weeks or the Festival of Booths, goes back to Jerusalem, gets caught up in the temple, chatting and talking with them, forgets the time. And that alone, I think, should have convinced everybody that he wasn't just a normal kid because he never even got into trouble. <laughs> I mean, his mother says, what have you been up to? You imagine this, you know, you find your kid after days of searching for him, and he's in the temple talking to all these old geezers, you know, about serious religion and stuff, and you say, what are you doing? Said, well, don't you know I was going to be here? It's kind of interesting. It, it's just one of those little things that, that make the more human picture of Christ. Okay? And of course, 
Uh, that, that, by the way, the Jesus, uh, the LSD, is actually not in there. So it's on a hill overlooking the city. And, of course, several of the churches have attached museums with holy relics, for which they will charge you whatever the going rate is to go and look at them. And they probably have gift shops with copies of the holy relics, so you can come back with a piece of the, the cross or, or whatever. I don't know. Modern Nazareth today is, is a regional market, a big trade center for the Arabs of Galilee. In other words, it's, a, it's the market town for that region. Um, tourism is, is very popular, as I just said. Half the Christians in the world go there. And it's light manufacturing. Uh, Business is all around. So it's a pretty lively place. Um, a lot of the workers live in, in Nazareth and, and can, you know, go to jobs in the Haifa Bay area and, and that sort of thing. And there's a where they work actually. And again, bone of contention here is is in the Jewish settle, settlements on the plain of Estrelion, which is where the, the the Israelis are putting up these settlements in sort of defiance of the Oslo Accords or something. It's it's a real it's as mixed up today as it was back then. In 1957, they built a place called Upper Nazareth. So you've got Nazareth, Upper Nazareth. Uh, on the hills to the east of the city, and that has actually a auto assembly and textile plants and things like that. So that's a, a real up and coming place. It's also the administrative seat of Israel's northern district. I, I don't go into politics here very much, as you know, and Israel's divided up into different districts, and there's a tremendous amount of tension wherever you go, just because Nazareth is a, to us, biblical site of some uh, reputation, it's still caught up in this conflict between Israelis and Arabs, and probably always will be. Okay, in the New Testament, in the New Testament, let's go back to that, the city is described, as I said, on the, as, a, as a Jewish, uh, sorry, as a childish home of Jesus, and, uh, you know, obviously is a center for pilgrimage and Lots of shrines connect, you know, all the events that come up in the Bible, somebody's got a shrine or something that says, oh, it happened here, you know. One, one conjecture, I went into this a bit looking at the, the root word of Nazareth, is that Nazareth is designed from one of the Hebrew words for branch, okay? If you remember in Isaiah 11, uh, um, there's a... There's a uh, Verse 1, in fact, there's a, uh, a comment, and I have to read it because it says, from Jesse's roots, a branch, and if you read the Hebrew, it's netza, okay, will bear fruit. So so uh, some people think of the Nazareth, that's a reference to Nazareth. You know, it's a bit tenuous, but it's there. Uh, alternatively, the name can derive from the verb nazar, which is to watch or guard or keep, you know, used in the sense of a, a watchtower. Uh, or a guard place, implying that the early town, most of the town's now in a valley, but the early town was on the brow of a hill. Or it could be, be, be the word preserved or protected in, in reference to its secluded position, because Nazareth is kind of buried down in the hills. It's hard to see. My problem is that the negative references to Nazareth in the Gospel of John suggest that the pre-Christian Jews didn't connect the town's name to the prophecy. They, they just didn't get it. Um, it's funny, the Arabic name for Nazareth is Al-Nazira, and Jesus, the Arabic Yasu, is also called Al-Nazira. And in fact, uh, the, the, the Arab tradition names people according to where they come from, in either geographical or, or tribal terms. So he's from Nazareth, he's a Naziri, okay? Uh, in, in the Quran, Christians are referred to as Nazara, meaning the followers of al Naziri, in other words, those who follow Jesus. But in Luke's Gospel, it's described as a city of Galilee, which sounds, doesn't, doesn't match up with what we've been hearing so far. Uh, but here's the interesting thing. It's the home of Mary. Okay, Mary lives in Nazareth. Following the birth and the early events of chapter 2 of Luke's Gospel, you know, uh, Annunciation and everything else, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus referred to Galilee to their own city 
of Nazareth. So it makes it very clear that, that, that that's where they're from. Okay, so they go to Nazareth. And, and, in, and English translations of the New Testament, uh, the phrase Jesus of Nazareth appears about 17 or 18 times. So it, it's fixed in there, you know, Jesus came from Nazareth. <coughs> and, and Nazareth is, even in the Greek, in an old Greek, third, fourth century document, uh, version of the New Testament that survives today, Nazareth is mentioned 12 times. And of course, Eusebius, the great writer of that time, refers to the settlement, not a city, a settlement, as Nazara. Okay? Now the first non-Christian reference to Nazareth is in an inscription on a marble fragment from a synagogue found in Caesarea Maritima in about 1962, and it gives the town's name as NZRT, which is, you know, the Hebrew comes without vowels. And it looks like we're running out of time. But that inscription dates from about AD 300. So we'll pick it up there next week and see where and what happened around that time. <coughs> Excuse me. Until then, read Luke. There's some interesting descriptions in there. Good night. God bless you.